Good morning, everybody. This is Rant Burgers. Thank you for listening. Just a short note. Um, in order to do something like this, you have to have a delusion. You have to have a delusion that what you're doing, somebody's going to want to listen to, and it's going to entertain them. And that's kind of a tough delusion to keep up. So, uh, feedback is good. I think you should give the people you like on the Voluntary Virtues Network feedback and let them know how much you like what they're doing. Because that's the only way we know if what we're doing is actually something worthwhile to you. It's something that uh, entertains you and informs you. Uh, I'm not asking for me because I honestly don't think this is worth that much. But if you like somebody else on Voluntary Virtues Network, if you happen to stumble across me, go ahead and drop them a like and drop them a comment. It's really important. Um, it's interesting. I should stop waiting until the last minute to record these, but that's the way my schedule's kind of worked out. And what I'm thinking about tomorrow, Saturday, or Sunday, or Monday, about what I want to talk to you about, never really what I talk, want to talk about when I get here to recording time. Um, uh, I just read where Rolf Harris... A guy in uh, the UK, an entertainer, has been sentenced to six years on multiple counts of raping children. Uh, I have always kind of had a uh, burr under my saddle about Rolf Harris since I first heard the original cut of Tie Me Kangaroo Down, where one of the verses says about, Let me abos go loose, Lou. Meaning, uh, emancipate my enslaved aboriginals. I always thought that was um, uncalled for. Uh, Rolf Harris deleted that verse from his song and apologized for it several times. But, uh, you know, it, it speaks to um, an attitude. And I'll take a detour back over here to another thing I wanted to talk about. There's a guy named uh, Rosenberg who came up with a theory called uh, nonviolent communication. Now, you can hear all about the pitfalls and, and traps of that if you listen to Brett Vinat's School Sucks podcast. Okay? But one of the big concepts that I gleaned from that is the concept of enemy imagery. And um, it's a pretty common human piece of mental equipment. Uh, even we voluntarists do it. We speak of the statists. And we group a bunch of people who believe in the state into a big box. And then we talk about them as though they're all one thing. We develop enemy imagery about statists. Okay? And at that point, we're kind of cutting our own throats. We are conceptually um, proving them right. right. We're joining their camp when we do that. Isn't that weird? Their camp. As though they're camped on the other side of the battlefield. We're going to go over there and sit with them and say, Yeah, don't those other guys suck. Yeah, see, um, if you really plumb down to the bottom of this, it, 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 this it, if you find your ideas circling back on themselves and, and contradicting themselves, then, well, you know, you're making progress. Um, so we, uh, in terms of racism, people like to develop enemy imagery. They like to develop a name and, and, and lump t people together in that box and then say that people who are in that box aren't really people. And in Australia, it seems as though that box with Aborigine people, with Aboriginal people in it, um, has been kind of vile for a little bit uh, longer than uh, the U.S. has been open about our racism in this culture. Um, but just because the U.S. stopped talking about racism, just because we, just because racism became an impolite topic that you don't that you don't bring up in polite company, doesn't mean it went away. It just meant people stopped talking about it. I think there's still a lot of racism to look at in our culture, and we need to, you know, look at it and try to root it out because it's it's part of dehumanizing the other. It's part of the enemy imagery. And when we do that, we uh, 
we're not moving towards freedom. We're moving away from it. Um, this latest incident down at the border with uh, children coming across the border and then being moved around by the immigration service and people protesting and running around and acting like tards. What a horrifying mess. How awful. I mean, a small child separated in another country where he doesn't speak the language, separated from his parents, and then shipped around like cattle while people scream at him for nothing he did. Man, oh, that's awful. And then you get people just diving straight into the 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 stereotyping and the tropes and the and the enemy imagery and and you know what what's a human tragedy is being made a human tragedy on another level it's just awful just awful uh so yeah my my opinion is uh what is the most humane thing to do right at this moment. Oh, here's my co-star, Angel the Cat. Oh, say hello to the freedom lovers, Angel the Cat. Well, I'm sorry I'm recording right now, so I don't get to rearrange myself for the comfort of the kitty. Okay, so, uh, Rolf Harris had a song with a little bit of imagery in, enemy imagery in it that I did not like. As a, you know, he should have used cat butts. Apparently, I like those. Cat butts! Cat butts! <laughs> Alright. So, Rolf Harris raped a number of children, and he got sentenced to jail for it. Rolf Harris was an entertainer, and in the way our market works, entertainers can reach huge numbers of people, and that generates a lot of money. And so, uh, a successful entertainer, in terms of the mass market, immediately puts himself at the top of a pyramid of money and influence. Okay, And even somebody we would consider a minor celebrity generates a, a lot of income, just because there's so many of us in the audience. And this has put a lot of... UK celebrities in a position of having enough influence to surround themselves with yes men, to have enough influence where they can overcome the the no in our society that ten, that we all feel kind of restrained by, you know. I can't go speeding in my car. If I do, I'm going to get a ticket and I will suffer severe consequences and if I keep doing it the consequences could get quite dire. Okay, Now, whether or not the consequence is the government taking away my license and then that setting me up to get arrested and charged and thrown in a rape cage, or in a free market society, if I was not, if I was 86 off a road system for abusing it, where the owner of the road system would just not let me drive on his road anymore. Okay. Um, either way, there are no's in society, and there are lines that we don't cross. But somebody with a lot of influence could cross those lines, and he can get used to the idea of just walking across lines you and I, you and I obey every day. Okay? Having that sort of power, even for somebody as, uh, as B-list as Rolf Harris, um, it tends to break us. It tends to break human beings. We're not built for that. It makes us crazy. And you can see it with the with Harris and the other UK celebrities who have, you know, um, Jimmy, what's his name? Uh, no, it's not Jimmy Meow Angel. Uh, Jimmy, what's, Jimmy Savile, okay? This whole scandal waited until he was dead to explode, okay? Um... So basically, he spent all of his life getting away with raping children because he was a popular and wealthy enough entertainer to blow through that line. And where other people, isn't that odd, other people were not willing to enforce the consequence upon him that they felt would be good to enforce on you or me if you or I were to, uh, if you or I were to do the same thing. Um... 
so now there's more UK celebrities and creepily enough children's entertainers these are all people whose entertainment product was marketed to children and whose audience was composed mainly of children and they're the ones who had the eye for children ick I know angel I know tell you what why don't you give me about why don't you give me a few minutes and then I will be done recording my my vodcast and then I will be able to pet you okay so come on I negotiate with the cat her negotiation ploy is always meow okay so somebody with celebrity gets to cross lines then they feel then they get crazy and they feel like they're entitled to cross those lines um, this is how much of this is human how much of this is human nature how much of this happens every time somebody gets rich and powerful um, I don't know but I know that uh, the idea that the rules are different if you have lots of money that the rules are different if you can influence lots of people the rules are different if you're a celebrity or a politician well we see the results we see the results of that kind of thinking around us all the time so Rolf Harris is in his 80s and he's going away for a six-year stretch and good riddance to him but um, I would much rather see his uh, his estate pillaged to make reparations to the people he raped. But either way, you know, finally consequences catch up with somebody who thought he was beyond consequences. But I think, uh, you know, it, it deserves looking at this impulse among humans that the rich and powerful don't have the same rules we do. Because... Uh, once you allow that, basically you break all the rules. Basically, uh, you get this slide from a society where rules apply most of the time to most of the people down to where rules are for the little people and, and the big people get to do whatever they want. And that's called the decadence. It's called the, you know, the end of the decline of a civilization. Uh, so, yes. Uh, I was looking at the news, doing it news to do a news summary at you from a voluntarist point of view. Uh, that's mainly because no one particular subject grabbed me today. And so I hope you don't mind, and I hope you find my point of view useful to you. Um, next on my list is uh, Uber. Now, Uber and Lyft and a couple of others, I, I haven't booked up on Sidecar yet. But Uber and Lyft are taxi companies. What they do is they hire people in their cars, and then they put them on uh, on alert, and then they have a uh, smartphone app where you call up your your Uber uh, your Uber application. You say, "I am here, and I want to go there." The Uber program calculates the distance, charges your debit, charges your debit or credit card, and then dispatches the car to come and get you. Okay, people have been saying, like uh, Jeffrey Tucker, has been saying, the car's right there, it comes right there. Well, that kind of misunderstands the point of dispatching vehicles to go get people. Okay. Um, the car will come and get you as soon as he's able to, as soon as they have a car to dispatch. If they're busy, they won't have a car to dispatch to you for a while. If all the cars are somewhere else, the cars will take a while to get to you. It's simple physics. Okay. Um, right now, uh, they're making a lot of money based on the idea of they aren't taxi cabs, which makes me very sad. I'm a taxi driver. That's what I do for a living. Um... So, yeah, having somebody make money off of saying, I'm not you, yeah, it's nice. Okay, cool. But understand that Uber and Lyft are right now at the top of a bubble. They are writing a bubble, and that bubble will break. And here's why. Um, 
one of the things that Uber has going for it is that your car your card is charged automatically when you make the call for the vehicle okay so no money changes hands so there wouldn't be much point in robbing an Uber driver okay so that's a safety issue that's actually interesting um, I don't know if I would prefer that kind of business model because I like getting money in hand I get paid daily from driving a cab I don't get paid very much not very much at all but I get paid daily and that's and I kind of like that but on the uber I don't know how they do it I know I don't know how they pay out the drivers maybe there's a weekly check or maybe it just credits the driver's account when he takes the ride I don't know but uh, the, there's a difference in how the money changes hands okay uh, tinfoil hatters will say yes now the NSA knows exactly where you went from where you your your starting point your destination and how much you paid and they get to track all of it and if we get to a point where uh, people who are not in favor with the government get their credit or debit cards shut off that could be a problem but now nah, let's go ahead and put the tinfoil hat stuff aside for right now uh, I believe there will come a time where the government will shut down accounts of people it doesn't like but I believe that a few weeks after that there will be people rioting in the streets so I don't think that's I don't think that's going to be a big issue what I'm thinking is going to be the big issue for Uber is um, that they're at the top of their bubble now all their cars are fresh I tell people that being in taxi cab is where evil minivans go when they die. Okay, well, how you use your car normally, if you're an average person or if you fit within the imaginary strictures of averageness, there, you get up in the morning, you do your routine, you go out to your car, you start it up, you drive it to work, then you turn it off and you leave it in the parking lot at your workplace for eight hours then you come out you get in your car you start it up and you drive home usually this trip is within two or three miles okay um i will do that 15 or 20 times every day okay um on a busy day you will get in your car start it up drive it a few miles to a shopping center and then drive it a few miles more to a post office drive it a couple more to a to a doctor's office or something and then you'll put it home and that's a hard day for your car that is about a quarter of one day for a taxi cab and the taxis do it all day and all night when I finish with my taxi cab in the afternoon I f fill it with fuel I clean it and then I hand it to the next guy and he does it for 12 more hours okay so and taxis are a public place so when people get into them they pick their nose and wipe it on the seats they spill stuff you know they they do they do things that we really wish they wouldn't do but you can't police people and not hit things while you're driving at the same time and trying to overly control people in your taxi cab makes it a bad customer service experience so you know we're kind of slanted towards you know take a look in the cab every so often clean it up if there's a mess but so you get this you get this real destructive use cycle in a taxi okay and here in Spokane, I'm not sure in other in other cities, but here in Spokane, taxis are at the bottom of the economic scale. Taxis are a bottom feeder job, and they are not a business where the owner wears a suit and hobnobs with the land developers. Okay, so that means that they have to mind every penny. They have to be very economic with their use of their own money and that means that most taxi owners will get used cars to be their taxis uh, when I first started driving taxi in 1992 and 93 the pop the most popular ones were used up police cars because you can get them cheap at the auction see so the police drive the cars because they don't the, the police drive their cars hard because they see themselves as action heroes and they don't have to pay for any of the repairs or maintenance Okay, so you get a car that's used up that way, and then it's sent to auction, and then it's then it's painted yellow, and a light's put on top of it, and it turns into a taxi cab. The yellow is, you know, a a, a metaphor. In city cab, our cabs are forest green, but they have a light on top. 
Um, so you get a beat up old car that's given a once over and given a paint job and turns into a taxi and then undergoes the most hellish existence a car can undergo. Okay. Well, except for a demolition derby. I don't even know if do, pe do people still do that? But, yeah, uh, so people who drive for Uber. Now, Uber is just like a taxi service in that the drivers are independent subcontractors. So Uber says, I will contract with you to go get people at my direction, and then I'll pay you to do that, right? That's exactly how the taxi companies operate. That's how come they're not obligated to pay me minimum wage. That's how come they're not obligated under labor and industries laws or anything like that. It's because technically I'm an independent subcontractor to the taxi company, and that's exactly the same system Uber has set up. So what happens with Uber though is it's not a taxi company owner who gets independent subcontacted drivers to drive his cabs around. Uber hires the person and their car. Okay, So on a busy night this person's car is going to be doing all those same things a taxi cab does starting and stopping. Okay, Stop and go driving. All right, People in the car who do not respect the vehicle as somebody's property. Although I believe at the early going people will be a little more respectful. Here in about three years, people are not going to be respecting Uber cars. All right, And so what you're going to see is you're going to see the Uber cars start to fall away from being clean, fresh cars, personal vehicles, into being messed up rattle traps. Or, more likely, um, as the car gets worse and worse from the hard use, the people's ratings will get less and less. So another thing Uber does. The drivers rate the customers, the customers rate the driver, okay? So as the driver shows up in a car with some dings and dents in it, the engine sounds a little rough, you could tell something was spilled on the seat a few days ago, the, um, the uh, rating will become less. And as the rating becomes less, Uber will stop contracting to that driver. So the driver will use his car up, and then he'll find car calls coming in less and less and then he'll have to go get a different job because Uber won't be paying him enough. So what you'll see is this cycle of new fresh drivers and they will burn through the people willing to drive through for Uber quite quickly. And eventually what will happen is they'll get to their last batch of drivers and as their ratings drop because their cars are more beat up, you'll see Uber become another taxi company. Now there's arguments about the regulations there's arguments about uh, which regulations Uber follows compared to which uh, regulations, say, city cab follows. Now, as a voluntarist, my thought is let's let the customer be the driver of that. Let's let the customer decide what they want to see from a vehicle and let the market decide. That's not the way it is right now. Right now, um, my, the owner of city cab is talking to the city council of Spokane to try to get them to lay down the law that Uber has to follow all the same all the same rules as a taxi company, okay? Um, I believe that uh, you will see that happen more and more. And it, for city comp for city councils or for county commissioners, okay, their job is professional control freaks. What are they going to do? They're go they are they going to err on the side of let's let the market decide and set the taxi companies free the way Uber the way Uber is relatively free from regulation, or are they going to say okay Uber you have to follow all the same regulations the taxi companies do? Hmm. Let's go ahead and lay some odds on that one. Yeah. So in order to operate in several places, Uber will have to f start obeying taxi regulations, and eventually you know time tide, use and abuse, and regulation are going to turn Uber into just another taxi company. And so I'm not too worried about it. Okay, I don't have a car right now that I could vacuum up and clean up and drive as an Uber car. If I did, I might think about it, but it would be essentially the same job as I have right now. Um, just with a just with a high-tech gloss. I do like the uh, Uber uh, capability for drivers to rate customers or for customers to rate drivers. I think m taxi companies sh will uptake that in time. But uh, 
Uh, let's see. That was me ranting about Uber. Oh, wow. That took a little while, didn't it? Um, I was going to talk about uh, other stuff in the news, but I don't think I have enough time. In the Ukraine, there's one thing that happened that I think is worth looking at. Uh, Vladimir Putin went to a uh, week last week. He went to the to the Russian Duma, and he told them, "No, take back that authorization to use force in the Ukraine." And they went, "What?" And they said, "Do it." And so they voted and withdrew his authorization to use force in Ukraine. Have you ever heard of a national leader ever doing that? I think if he wanted to use force in Ukraine, he could do it. Nobody would say boo, but publicly renouncing the use of force. Okay, let's not forget that Putin is a tyrant. He is not a nice guy. But he's not playing at the same overwhelming power level the United States is. So the United States can afford to be stupid. He's a smart tyrant. Okay, So his moves are going to be careful and measured and intelligent and uh, and so I think right now what he's doing is trying to back down tensions in Ukraine to uh, uh, to avoid a possibility of it sparking into a wider war which would suck it would suck ass here on the hundredth year anniversary of uh, of the uh, first world war you know having another European conflict blow up in our face that that would be filled with blood-soaked irony and uh, so anything that results in fewer deaths I kinda like I'm in favor of it um, one last thing please shut up about Hobby Lobby nobody gives a damn about Hobby Lobby Hobby Lobby Hobby Lobby Hobby Lobby look this group of monkeys is forcing that group of monkeys to do a thing at gunpoint but some monkeys and some robes made a decision about one finicky point at what is being forced to be done. Yay. <coughs> so I am no fan of, well, I should probably not cough on the mic anymore. I apologize for that. But I'm no fan of Hobby Lobby or any of that crap. And I'm not very fond of hearing about it because you know, I understand that uh, that uh, feminists, people who are knee-jerk feminists, see this as an affront to feminism and a, an affront to equal rights. But uh, in my mind, uh, contraception should be available at the pharmacy desk in your supermarket, just like everything else. And if it was, and it was on the market, it would be cheap, 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 cheap. And if we lived in that world, we'd all be a lot richer. And so that would make cheap contraception much more affordable to everybody. And you could take it or use it as you chose or did not choose. Um, let's see, what else? Israel, Palestine. That goes back to that uh, enemy imagery I was talking about. Palestinians see Israelis as the bad guys. Israelis see Palestinians as the bad guys. Um, the problem is that there is in Israel and is a Palestine for these people to consider themselves part of and to consider other people outside of. Okay? And that's why there's going to be problems. That's why there's always going to be problems. That's why there's always going to be horrifying injustice, mass murder, and violence. Because the Palestinians are under one flag and Israelis are under the other flag and think that the people under the opposing flag are not fully human and that it's not really murder when you kill them. Yeah, so that's the solution to Israel-Palestine right there. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, to abandon the flags and see everybody as human beings. That's the solution. Uh, so, here we go. We're just at about the end of our time today. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, please drop a like or drop a comment, and please make sure that you let other people who are actually doing entertaining things here on the Voluntary Virtues Network, let them know that uh, that you like what they're doing. And have a good day. See you next week.